from sung worship to your written word, the word that you provided for us, the word that enables us to discover more about you, to discover more about how we might live for you. We pray that our minds and our hearts would be alert to what you're saying as we read this word and as Julie comes to explain it to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you've got a Bible in front of you or maybe on your phone, um, please turn to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 5 and read through to 13, and then we'll jump to verse 18 and read through to verse 31. Uh, Simon's going to help me because it's a lengthy reading. So um, the way we're going to do this is basically I'm going to be narrator and rulers, baddies, as Simon put it, uh, the religious elite, and Simon is going to be the goodies. He's going to be Peter, Peter and John, and the other Christians. So that's, just think, baddie good. Apart from, we did have some explanation, some, some discussion as to whether the narrator counts as baddie. I don't think so. I think he's also a goodie. But anyway, here we go. Narrator and baddies. Let's put it that way. All right, so you should be at Acts chapter 4 by now. And we're going to start at verse 5. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or name did you do this? And as a side note, Peter and John have just healed a lame man. So they're asking him, by what power? Or name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, we are being called to account today. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness showed to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you build as rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no under he- other name under heaven given to people by which, that, which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle and we cannot deny it. But to stop this from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in his name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. That was quite old then. I've just turned 40. 40 is really old. (laughs) On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. 
Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders throughout, through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Julie, over to you. I was never good with technology. I discovered that yesterday when my internet went down, I hadn't a clue what to do. But I was reminded this morning, just before I preach, that uh, God never lets us down. My internet let me down, couldn't get on my emails, so that was that. I'm, I'm having a person who knows more about it than I do round to find out what's the matter. But I was thinking, you know, God doesn't let us down. I really felt as though somebody needed to know that. We've had all these songs about his love never fails. You know, God will never let us down. We may not feel him, but he's always got a listening ear. And technology and people will let us down, unfortunately. But God will never, never let any one of you down. Right, this is about encountering God, being filled with the Holy Spirit. When I was first given this, I was thinking, hmm, I honestly don't feel qualified to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit because how often I forget to ask God to fill me. And lockdown hasn't happened, helped. But surely we cannot blame outward circumstances for not being filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-off experience. It should be ongoing. Ephesians 5.18 says, Don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation or overindulgence, but be filled with the Spirit. And it's go on being filled with the Spirit. So don't get drunk with wine. You only get a hangover. And you don't feel very well afterwards. But go on being filled with the Spirit, which brings joy and peace. By the way, the Holy Spirit is a person. The third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now we see from Acts 4 that Peter and John had been arrested and put in custody. Why? Had they been causing a riot? Had they been drunk and disorderly? Have they got into a fight? No. They were minding their own business about to enter the temple. On their way, they healed a man who had been lame, who was unable to walk, and he was a beggar. And it is said that the man got up, walking and leaping and praising God. I think we'd all be if we hadn't been able to walk. Dear me. Then they began, the apostles began to preach the good news to the people, to the crowd that had gathered, saying that Jesus is alive. But the chief priests were angry, and they didn't like them preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So Peter and John were brought before the authorities and chief priests, and in verse 5, it says, we've heard it, and Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to testify about Jesus. Now, they couldn't imprison Peter and John as they hadn't committed any crime or broken any law, come to that. So they threatened them. And ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. But all Peter and John said was, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. 
When they left, what did they do? Did they go back to the church and complain and say, not fair? Or blame someone for their misfortune, as happens today? Or have a pity party? No. They told their friends what had happened. Then all of them, note, all of them, began to sing praises of God. They referred to God as Sovereign Lord. And quoted from Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? Kings of the earth and rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointing. Then they asked for boldness to carry on telling people the good news and healing people. And they encountered God and were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus never promised us an easy ride. If we speak of Jesus, we could have opposition. Don't feel sorry for yourselves. Just carry on doing what God says. At the beginning of lockdown, I heard a song. You are God and you still reign. One part of the song said, you are God and I am not, which is a good reminder, especially when things get rough. I'm not God. God is still on his throne and Jesus is still seated at God's right hand. That's what the early church believed. They all praised him and spoke his word. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit and encountered God. Sovereign Lord, you still reign. It wasn't a quiet meeting, I'm quite certain. Can you imagine? A whole load of everybody here all spoke at once and praised God all at once. It was noisy. I remember going to a prayer meeting when I was in Uganda. You can imagine, can't you? Can you? And everybody, literally everyone, was walking around. They were all praying, shouting, and worshipping God. So it was rather loud, to say the least. Let's not be afraid of too noise as long as it's not disrespectful. The early church knew their need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they knew their need of God. Last week, Helen said that we need to ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sure some of you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, I'm going to let you join in. What was it like? Can any of you tell me? Uh, Somebody tell me. Speak to me. What was it like? <laughs> delightful. Oh, we like that. Wonderful. Delightful. De- oh, Matt was overwhelmed. <laughs> Anybody else? Peaceful. Peaceful. Loving. Loving. Yeah. Are you waving in the back? Yeah. Powerful. Powerful. Yes. Amen. Yes. I know once I I just burst out laughing. (laughs) Couldn't help it. So, the Holy Spirit can can do all things in all ways. We walk by faith, not by sight. So we need the Holy Spirit so we can live the Christian life. I I don't know why I put that, but I feel we do need the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. We can't do it on our own. We can't try and be good. Well, I can't. I was reminded of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. (laughs) This is from the Passion Translation. As for us... 
We have these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination, for the path has already been marked out before us. We look, from the nat- look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus, who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of God. Jesus took our punishment for sin on the cross. Surely that's a reason to praise and worship God. Our wonderful Savior saw that the you and I would be his. When we give our lives to Jesus and turn from sin and trust and believe on him. That's something the apostles understood. They had been chosen by God and he would fill them with his Holy Spirit so they could live the Christian life and encounter God. Encountering God is always by faith. When we pray, we're talking to God. When we worship, God is exalted. The early church worshipped God. They lifted up the name of Jesus. They spoke his word and they gave him glory. When we do that, we encounter God and are filled with his Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, Lord, that you want to encounter us. You want, you died for us so that we could be yours. You died for us so that we could have a relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, that we will learn to encounter you as we pray, as we worship, that we will encounter you, that your Holy Spirit will fill us and give us the ability to do what you've asked us to do, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.